It's about time for us to begin our next session. Again, thankful to all that have come to be with us today. We know this is a very important subject, and we find out very quickly there's a lot of material there to be covered. Our next speaker is going to be Casey Grant. He preaches for the McElroy Congregation of the Lord's Body up uh, between Raven and Springs and Pocahontas. And we're glad to have him here with us today. And in just a few minutes after Brother Mike Porsche, who preaches for the Congregation of Hoxie, is going to lead us in the word of prayer. And then Brother Casey will bring us his lesson. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful for this very day of life, thankful for the occasion that brings us together. We are thankful for our brethren, for the men who have spent time preparing these lessons and the opportunity we have to learn more of Thee and to learn about Thy Word. We pray and ask, dear Heavenly Father, Your blessings upon this effort, that You would continue to bless this good congregation as they have saw fit to host this lectureship. Continue to bless them, the preacher and the elders here in Black Rock, and we ask for Your continued blessings. Upon each and every congregation that is represented, may we continually open our minds and our hearts to thy word. May we learn more of thee. May we grow not only in our faith, but our fellowship with one another. We pray and ask you to bless our efforts, continue to help and strengthen us, encourage us, and forgive us where we do sin. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone here this morning. We've had two very good lessons, very informative lessons this morning on the beginnings of the church and then the falling away of the church into apostasy. And I'm going to be picking up right pretty much where Steve left off. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the church in the Middle Ages, really from the, the time that the Catholic Church came into being, about 606, all the way up to the year 1500. And this was a very challenging uh, period of time to research. As I'll uh, get into momentarily, the records are very, very sparse. In fact, many of the records that we have uh, come from the Catholic Church itself and the uh, negative things that they had to say about those who opposed uh, their teachings, their doctrines. But Winston Churchill, he's credited with saying that history is written by the victors. And that's true to a point, but in reality, uh, history is written by everyone. Uh, history is our past. It's where we've been. Uh, we can see the things we accomplished and also those things that we failed. But it is true that the, those that are the most dominant, those that are the most uh, influential, they can control the narrative of history. And that is what happened throughout the Middle Ages when it comes to the church. Uh, the Catholic Church rose to dominance, and they were the most powerful, and they controlled the narrative. Uh, the Lord's Church was, was, uh, wasn't able to be meeting as openly as we do today. But revisionism, that's nothing new. Uh, that's been going on since the beginning of, of recorded history. And the church is certainly not immune to that. Uh, ever since the founding of the church, uh, as Steve got into a little bit in his lesson, uh, revisionism has taken place. People have been trying to change uh, the narrative. And what happened over time is a body that does not resemble what we read about in the New Testament rose to prominence, rose to power. Uh, for example, uh, one of the, the things that, that's been revised is the, the idea that Peter uh, became the first pope and, and became head of the church. And I know Steve was talking about uh, that idea where it came from, uh, Ignatius, and, and how uh, instead of a, a plurality of elders over a local congregation, he would go to a bishop over the congregation, which finally went so far as a one man over a whole group of congregations. Uh, this was in keeping with the uh, Roman hierarchy in, in the Roman government at the time. Uh, another thing that's, that uh, has been revised is that even today, uh, people, they say, well, there's no evidence of, of miracles happening today. So apparently the, the miracles that were performed in the first century must not have happened. Uh, but we know 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us the reason that we don't have those miracles today. But the historical records for the churches of Christ during the Middle Ages, they are very sparse. They're almost non-existent. But 
the lack of historical record does not prove that faithful congregations of the Lord's Church ever ceased to exist at any period of time upon the earth. And even though the records are sparse, there is proof uh, that they did continue to, to exist throughout the centuries. As the Roman Empire began to crumble in the 5th century, uh, by 476, the Western Empire had fallen. Uh, the eastern part of the empire thrived in Constantinople for almost another thousand years until the Constantinople fell to the, to, to the, to the Muslims in, in 1453. But there was a vacuum there in the Western Empire, and it was filled by the Roman Catholic Church. They were able to, to come in and uh, fill that vacuum. Now, according to the typical beliefs held by most historians, Christianity was the most common religion throughout Europe during the Middle Ages. But this idea is based upon the misunderstanding of what Christianity truly is. They see it as the Roman Catholic Church. It's what constitutes uh, Christianity. And, and to the secular mindset, we can see how that makes perfect sense. Because isn't the Roman Catholic Church directly descended from the original church that was founded on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2? Well, the answer to that question is a resounding no. It is not directly descended from the church that was founded on the day of Pentecost. Mankind has always been quick to depart from God's word, from his ways. Uh, we see evidence of this in Genesis chapter 3. We see Adam and Eve uh, doing it. We see all throughout the Old Testament uh, it happening over and over again. Uh, the church was, as Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, it was the manifold wisdom of God. And it was his eternal purpose. He sent a Savior here because we were so quick to depart from his ways. And one thing that that Savior did, Jesus Christ, was establish his church. Those we've already seen in our lessons today, even though the church was here, it was easy to depart from his ways. And this is where pagan doctrines, Jewish doctrines came in, uh, the ceremonies, uh, the decrees, and the different changes that they made. And all these developments, they were foreign to the Bible, foreign to, to God's word and his will, but they were very, very important in the development of church history. Centuries of, of ignorance, of, ignorance uh, of superstition, of pride, and just old-fashioned greed. Those were ingredients to the birth of the apostate church that we see uh, rise to its height of power during the Middle Ages. And Paul, he had predicted that, that some would depart from the faith. Uh, Steve started his lesson out this morning by having us turn to, to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. And there in verse 1, Paul wrote, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. And, and we see this uh, very, very evident. We can look back in our history of our lives, of, of us here today, and uh, the, the amount of time of changes that we've seen just in, in new doctrines and new religions that, that pop up. Uh, it's nothing new. But we date the Roman Catholic Church to around the year 600. In the year 590, Gregory the Great, he became the first man to, to formally take the title of Pontifus Maximus. And then in 606, Boniface III, he became the, the first to use the title of Pope or Universal Bishop. And this was the idea that Ignatius had, had put forth about four or 500 years before that. Uh, and these were titles that were never before used by any man, uh, simply because Jesus is, is the, the head of his church. But these changes, they continued throughout the Middle Ages. Uh, there was just some examples of this is that Latin, it was used to be, was the only language of the scriptures. Uh, the, uh, the scriptures were written in Latin, they were spoken in Latin, and of course this for the, for the unlearned of the time made it difficult for them to know what the scriptures actually said. Uh, Gregory the Great, he developed the, the doctrine of, of purgatory, and that was instrumental in, in establishing the medieval sacrament system that the Roman Catholic Church came to use. And they had a separate priesthood that was above uh, everyone else, where the Bible tells us that all Christians, 
priest. Peter tells us this in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 and, and 9. And these are but a few of the changes that slowly, over time, perverted the truth and moved the church away from the path of, of righteousness. And as I said earlier, these were contrary to the, to the Bible, but they were important in the development of church history. But with these changes came uh, violent persecution. Uh, persecution was not new to the church, as, as Rob pointed out in his lesson. They were, it, the church was born in time of persecution. Uh, and it continued on. But it started out as the Jewish authorities being the ones persecuting, going to the Roman authorities being the one persecuted, until it's to the church authorities, to the Roman Catholic church authorities who were doing the persecution. And that's what was happening in the Middle Ages. And that persecution was every bit as, as dangerous or as oppressive as what we read about in the book of Acts. But the question is, did the church exist during the Middle Ages. Well, there were those who stood firm on God's truth, on God's word. You know, the church existed in the Middle Ages, not exactly the same way as, as it exists today. And, and what I mean by that is there were those who, who worshipped according to the teachings of, of Jesus Christ, uh, but they were forced to do that in secret. Tomorrow morning, we go to our respective congregations and, and we meet in order to, to worship. We don't have to worry about uh, being someone coming in and arresting us, being persecuted. That wasn't so in the Middle Ages. They had to do it in secret. You know, some people believe that from the time that the Catholic Church rose to power up until the American Restoration Movement began in the late 18th century, that there was not a single faithful congregation of the Lord's Church on earth. And I believe this to be incorrect, that the church founded on the day of Pentecost, has never ceased to exist. Now, the number of faithful Christians may have been small, but fortunately, it, the size of the congregation doesn't matter. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I there in the midst. I am there in the midst of them. Now, this is one of God's greatest promises to us. He'll always care for his church, and, and his concern is the same whether that congregation amounts to three people, 300 people, or 3,000 people. Because there's one condition of that, they, they have to truly meet in his name, you know, by his authority, by his will, his doctrine, obedience to his, as his word directs. Now the Catholic Church aggressively targeted dissenters, dissenters both to their doctrine from within and from without. And Christians that disagreed with their teachings were considered heretics. And, and they'd be physically punished for that, often many times killed. And even though these dissenting groups were small and they were persecuted, uh, they, and they didn't gain a notable place in recorded history, they did exist. And I'm going to give you some biblical proof to that and then also some uh, secular historical proof to that as well this morning. Now, as is common, they were misrepresented, maligned by history, and it makes it almost impossible to know exactly a whole lot about them, what they taught, what they believed, and as I said earlier, much of what we do know is what their enemies said about them in, in complaints. Well, how can we know that the one true church, the one that was found in the day of Pentecost, continued to exist all the way up through the Middle Ages? Well, throughout the centuries, God has preserved his word. And even during the Middle Ages, the truth of the gospel was available. And the, the, church, the, the Catholic Church may have been at the height of its power, uh, but even then, the Lord's church, his true church, was alive. As Isaiah 59.1 tells us, that God's hand is never shortened, that it can not save. So his truth was marching on. But I think the simple answer to the to this question of whether the church continued to exist or is found in the words of Jesus himself. In Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 17, it says, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. 
You know, the church was prophesied throughout the, the Old Testament, and it came into being uh, soon after Christ's ascension. Uh, we see that in Acts chapter 2. And Daniel prophesied that this kingdom would stand forever. This is Daniel 2, verse 44. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 states that the kingdom is unmovable. The church was, was God's plan before the foundation of the world, as, as Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 through 6 tells us. So if, if it's only those who Christ adds to his body through our complete obedience to, to him, if we're the only ones that are destined for heaven, well, how could the church ever cease to have, to exist? You know, either there was a remnant of the church uh, that never ceased to exist, or there was a time in history in which those living had no help of salvation, hope of salvation because there was no church to be added to. And that's contrary to what the Bible teaches. You know, Daniel declared Daniel 2.44. He said, and in the days of these kings... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. This scripture here is, is very clear. Once the, the kingdom was established, it would never, ever be destroyed. And that kingdom is the church, the church of Christ. And it would stand forever. And Jesus promised to build his church there in Matthew chapter 16 and and he pledged that the gates of Hades would not prevail against it in, in verse 18. And, uh, Brother J.W. McGarvey suggested that the, the church would never cease to be depopulated by the death of all its members. In a prophecy in, in which John told of the, the persecution of the church under the figure of a woman in Revelation chapter 12, in verse 6 he declared, The woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared. And this imagery that, that John puts forth, it suggests that even in times of severe hardship, the church would not become extinct. A remnant, though it may be small, would always remain. There's also historical proof of the church as well. And I found this very interesting as I uh, doing my study. As I said, when I first got into it, I couldn't find anything. But then I I found myself, uh, the internet is a great thing. I found myself on the internet reading on a public domain, reading records that had been translated 200 years ago from, from French and from German and from Italian. And it was what the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church had to say about these dissenting groups that I gleaned the most information for this, for this, uh, this lesson. And those, those records are difficult to, to find, but we have been able to, uh, to find some. For instance, early Christianity, it spread from Asia, Asia Minor to Europe and into southern Britain, which was occupied by the Celts, independent of Rome. And in fact, the earliest record of Christianity arriving in Britain occurred between the years 37 and 63. And that's, you know, the time that the apostles were still... Uh, alive. And in the year 141, in what's now Cambridgeshire, in the village of Grotta, uh, there's a record that says many were baptized. In the 4th century, uh, the historian uh, Vesuvius wrote the apostles passed beyond the ocean to the isles called the Britannic Isles. And while Tert Tertullian stated, the regions of Britain, which have never been penetrated by Roman arms, have received the religion of Christ. There's good evidence of the, the Celtic church. Uh, there, good evidence they believed in the, the universal priesthood of all believers. They believed in baptism by uh, complete immersion by those who believe and of the autonomy of, of congregations overseen by elected elders and deacons. And those are all marks of the true church. The historian Alfred Crosby says that Claudia Rufina was the wife of a Roman senator, Pudens, and she was a British convert to Christianity. And he claims that this same Claudia is mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 21. Here Paul, Paul writes, Eubulus greets you, as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brother. Well, if this is true, that this is the same Claudia, 
But it stands to reason that the, the Putin mentioned here is that Roman senator. And 422, the Catholic Bishop uh, Germanus complained that the church in Britain rejected the authority of Rome and other Catholic doctrines, going so far as practicing believers' baptism, even though infant baptism had been mandatory for 15 years by church doctrine. And from around the, the late 6th century, a sect, a sect of Christians uh, called publicans came to the notice of the, the Catholic authorities, and they were known for their ability to defend their doctrine from the writings of the New Testament. And this group had rejected infant baptism by teaching that faith is required before baptism. And at some point, uh, after severe persecution, we see that some 800 years later, the same group popped up in the 12th century, and they assisted the, the French church. There's a, a gentleman in England, his name's Keith Sidman, and he has a book that he put out several years ago called Traces of the Kingdom. And he was able to track faithful congregations of the Lord's Church in, in the British Isles back to the 6th century. And his book was invaluable in, in my research for this lesson. And if you've never read that book, I urge you to get it. It's, it's well worth your, your while. Uh, but much like the Jews throughout the Old Testament, there was simply a faithful remnant of Christians. who They didn't get carried away by the, the false doctrines that popped up around them. And they held to the truth of the apostles' doctrine. And I don't have time to go through every century, all ten of them, but just to, to give you a, a, a few of them. Throughout the seventh century, Christ Church in Britain continued to reject unscriptural doctrines being introduced by the Catholic Church. And we see in the eighth century, uh, when the, the Pope quoted Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19, uh, and was claiming that the keys of the kingdom were only given to Peter, uh, there was Christians in Britain that reminded him of, of Matthew 18, 18, where Jesus said that the keys of the kingdom were given to all the apostles. And we also see, in, beginning in the, around the year 900, the Catholic Church became more dogmatic than ever before in its, uh, its opinions and in its doctrines, and this resulted in a defense of the gospel from both within and without. And there were many non-Catholic Christians during the Middle Ages, and, and the church in in Europe, which uh, they're nicknamed the uh, uh, Waldensians, they later wrote that they had always existed. They traced their roots back to the early church. There was a man named Gandolfus uh, in the 11th century, and he was opposed to the doctrines of the Catholic Church. And he taught against infant baptism, saying, because to an infant that neither wills nor runs, that knows nothing of faith, is ignorant of its own salvation and welfare. And it also appears that this man, he established and he strengthened congregations of the Lord's Church throughout northern France and into Belgium during his lifetime. We see in the, in the early 12th century, there we see that uh, a man named Pierre de Brules was a Roman Catholic priest who was removed by the, the Catholic hierarchy for teaching what they considered to be unorthodox uh, doctrines. And uh, his followers were known as the, uh, the uh, Petrobusians, but they simply referred to themselves as, as Christians. And they appealed to return for the authority of the scriptures and of believers' baptism. They used Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, where Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. They used that as their authority for that. In 1118, there was a man named Gregory of Grimm, and he died after being tortured because he had been baptized by his grandfather, who in turn had been baptized, and both of them were baptized by a merchant for the remission of their sins. Uh, his grandfather had been baptized by a traveling merchant uh, from Venetia. And this man claimed he was from the only church of the saints. In 1143, there was a congregation of over 100 Christians that was seized on the lower Rhine, and under torture, uh, they confessed that such congregations were everywhere, but were in concealment. 
And due to the fact that there was no organized church hierarchy as the Roman Catholic Church was, was used to, it was extremely difficult for the authorities to hunt down and, and exterminate, stamp out these uh, congregations. But during the time of severe persecution, evangelists were spreading the gospel of Christ throughout Europe. And they came to support the churches that were being forced out of existence. By 1146, we see that uh, there was a man named Henry of Toulouse, and he was preaching the same doctrine, including believers' baptism, and denied Catholic teachings. And there was a, a monk named Bernard, and he stated in a letter that he wrote in 1147 to the Earl of St. Giles, he said, the churches are without people, the people without priests, the priests without honor, and Christians without Christ. The churches are no longer conceived holy, nor the sacraments sacred, sacred, nor are the festivals any more celebrated. Men die in their sins. Souls are buried away to the terrible tri tribunal without penitence or communion. Baptism is refused to infants who thus are precluded from salvation. You know, to the church, what Henry of Toulouse was preaching was heresy. And because he was preaching against infant baptism, these infants were precluded from salvation. Of course, we know that the New Testament uh, tells us that is not so. But it's said that, that Henry uh, and, and those like him were, were very right, widespread in Europe at this time. <clears throat> there was another man who wrote to Bernard in 1146, and he complained of a sect who had rejected infant baptism in, in favor of believers' baptism, and he had formed a Church of Christ separate and apart from the Catholic Church. And the elders of, of that church, were they offered to, to debate. They would debate their beliefs in the light of teaching of the scriptures. And the, this was, of course, rejected, and instead they were arrested and they were executed rather than, than anyone try to beat them in a, a debate. In Britain, in the 14th century, we see that men like uh, John Wycliffe John Purvey, uh, William Swinbury, they were all preaching that the ordaining of priests was not scriptural, declaring that the bread and wine were not Jesus' actual body, not his actual blood, that was idolatry. And, and they advocated that everyone should have free access to the scriptures in their own language. And it wasn't long after this that, that we did begin to see that. In Bohemia, uh, it was preached the simplicity of the first century church there at that time. You know, the Church of Christ in much of Europe had no official creed. They had no headquarters. They believed that the church was the community of the faithful. Uh, we didn't have to answer to individual bishops, individual priests. Uh, they encouraged Bible study, encouraged the emphasis on the scriptures rather than the rituals in worship. Even though the Lord's church may have been suppressed and, and the numbers may have dwindled, it never died out. Because if the prophet Isaiah declared, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth. <clears throat> and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sin. You know, we can establish with some certainty that New Christianity, New Testament Christianity, was, was being spread throughout Europe by the end of the 6th century. And Catholic authorities, they continued to stamp it out at every opportunity. But just as a dandelion multiplies it when you pick it up and you, and you blow uh, the seedlings into the wind, well, so spreads the Lord's church. God's word will always accomplish what God intended for it to accomplish. And Paul referred to this when he wrote that the gospel is a savor of life unto, unto life in them that are saved and an odor of death unto death in them that perish. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. You know, the, the word of God will either destroy those who hear it and do not obey it or redeem those who receive it and obey it. In 
conclusion. I'll wrap this up. The Middle Ages has often been characterized as the age of faith, but that label obscures the, the, the real truth. Now, what was incorrectly considered to be Christianity uh, was the dominant religion at the time, but not everyone even thought that with the, with the same intensity. Uh, for many centuries, the Bible was banned. Only one was a, a serious offense. Uh, and pra pagan tradition, traditions rather than the inspired word of God were used uh, for their doctrine and their ceremony. And <clears throat> You know, when the Bible did start to become more common and, and both church and state fought together to remove it. In fact, there was a letter written by uh, Thomas Lineker. Uh, he was a physician to both Kings Henry VII, the Seventh and the Eighth, and he was a, a, a Oxford pr professor. And when he read the New Testament for the first time in 1524, he said this, Either this is not the gospel, or we are not Christians, having thrown the scriptures to the wind. And even the School of Theology in Paris declared to the French Parliament, they said this is an end of religion if the study of Hebrew and Greek is permitted. Now, Brother Wayne Jackson, he expressed the connection between the power of God's word and the continued existence of the Church of Christ in, in this way. He says, he calls it the seed soil principle, and he said in the parable of the sower, Jesus described a man who sowed seed, some of which fell upon the good soil. And explaining the parable, he identified the seed as the word of God, Luke 8, 11, and the good ground as an honest and good heart, verse 15. Or as Mark expressed it, those who hear the word and accept it bear fruit, Mark 14, 20. And it necessarily follows, therefore, that whenever, within the past two millennia, and wherever, over the entire earth, the, the whole word of God has come in contact with an honest and good, receptive heart. A Christian has been the result. So a, cru a group of Christians constitutes a church. Uh, churches of Christ, therefore, could have existed at any place or any time over the past 20 centuries where those components happily combine together. There was another man named Dr. Hans Grimm, and he wrote a book called Tradition and History of the early churches of Christ in Central Europe. And his narrative begins with these words. It says, It has always been a real church of Christ in this world since Pentecost. And this means a church believing in faith, repentance, confession, and immersion for the remission of sin. A church which worshipped at least the first day of the week with hymns, prayers, the Lord's Supper, Bible study, and contributions for the saints. A church which worked under the oversight of bishops, deacons, and evangelists. A church, not some isolated seekers, but an organized church, which trusted in the Lord's promise that the power of death will never prevail against it. And Dr. Graham ends his uh, statement as powerful as the one with which he opened it. He says the torch did not die out. God had kindled it again and put it on a lampstand, and it gives light for everybody in the house. This was the fulfillment of Christ's promise. I am going to build my church, and the powers of death will never prevail against it. Many people attack the, the integrity of the church uh, with the claims that uh, non-denominational churches, the churches of Christ, did not exist until modern times, and uh, this is historical revisionist revisionism at its best. But when one is grounded in the truth, he's not, not tossed to and fro and carried away with every wind of doctrine, as Ephesians 4.14 tells us. The churches of Christ have existed. They have labored as a shining light of Christian influ influence in a world covered in darkness since the day that this glorious institution was established on the day of Pentecost. And Christianity is a religion that is grounded in history, it's grounded in truth. And no amount of, of historical provision will change this fact. Because even in the, in the darkest times of her existence, the Lord's church followed in the paths of righteousness and battled the darkness wherever it reared its ugly head. As Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, he says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor 
Do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and to give light to all who are in the house? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, thank you for your attention, and it's been my pleasure to speak with you this morning.